Um, first of all, welcome to this first live version of the um, Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series, the A. Richard Newton Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series. Uh, if you, um, uh, I'm happy to welcome you, first of all, for it. But if you uh, haven't been to B-Space, you haven't watched our you know, Emmy Award video, the one that we made for you, and the one that um, has basically the rules of how this thing works and you know all the stuff that you're um, kind of like the guidelines of, of how to participate in the lecture series, please do that. I'm not going to repeat the quote rules and, and the model right now, but uh, so go to B-Space for that. Uh, it's um, my... So of the approximately six lectures that you're going to get this semester, this is the first of the live ones. And it's my pleasure to introduce Pooja Sankar, who um, is the CEO of Piazza, and founder and CEO. Uh, I think you probably know it's an online course platform. Uh, here's a few statistics. It's in 25 countries. Uh, a thousand universities use it. Uh, 10,000 courses are are on it. Uh, Pooja has a um, has degrees from IIT Kanpur, from University of Maryland, and from Stanford. She's been she's worked at uh, um, Facebook, at Cosmics, and at Oracle uh, prior to um, uh, starting the company. Uh, and from what I know of the talk, uh, she's going to touch on. Uh, the importance of getting out of uh, comfort zone, which um, we think uh, here is uh, seminal to both entrepreneurship and to engineering leadership. So with that, I'm really happy that you're able to join us today and to be our first speaker of the series. Pooja, please. Okay. Awesome. Well, it's really good to be here. Uh, just show of hands, how many of you have heard of Piazza? <laughs> how many of you would have thought five years ago that I was convinced that whatever I did in my career, I'd never, never actually start a company? So five years ago, I thought whatever I did, I'd never start a company because it sounded terrifying. <laughs> That's the really interesting bit. Uh, today, a bit about myself. I am married to Sham Sankar. Um, we have a baby, one year old. I live with his parents and they help raise our child. Uh, I started a company four years ago. It's going really well now. Every top school, we have almost over 90% of STEM students using it across the world. And uh, he runs Palantir, so we're a really good household in the sense of both of us understand what it's like to push our careers to the limit. And interestingly enough, I actually went into Stanford Business School and failed. And my brother said, how do you possibly ever fail business school? Um, I entered into a very traditional arranged marriage at 22 when I knew barely anything about life. And four years later, left that. And today, I will say I'm very grateful for that because it's built me into who I am today. And when I look back at all the happy moments, all the great things that have happened, I have fond memories and I smile. But when I look back at all the challenging moments in my life, which there are many of, I'm very grateful because it's built me into who I am today. And I actually want to touch a lot more into the past that has been, if anything, challenging because I hope to share my perspective in this room today. So I was actually born in India, but I don't have an Indian accent because at the age of two, my dad chose to take all of us over to Canada and America while he was doing his PhD and postdoctorate as a professor. And at the age of 11, he and my mother had a choice to go back to India and raise us, my brother and I, and the Indian culture and values, or here in America. And he claims that he wanted to expose me and my brother to Indian culture and values, but I like to believe he didn't want us dating as a teenager here. So he moved us back to India, and it was a very, very difficult move. I was 11. I was used to growing up in a country that had pretty much anything you could ever want, to a city in India that maybe had four hours of electricity in the day, maybe four hours of running water in the day. And we'd all pack up in a car or a train and go to villages and visit all of our relatives. And I really saw what it was like to live and breathe in villages in India. And it was very difficult. I actually wasn't happy with my parents for moving me back for a really long time. It took me a couple of years. But then I started to get really, really in love with the family, the people, the culture. And I grew up there. 
in a really kind of a traditional Indian system where actually up until college, girls weren't allowed to speak to boys and boys were not allowed to speak to girls, and that was okay. But then I got into IIT, which was predominantly boys, <laughs> maybe three girls in my class, and that's really the starting of Piazza, which is when I was struggling on my homework, I always wished I had help, and I was too shy to speak to all the boys in my class. I don't know if this is a common feeling here among especially the girls or the Shire students, but it was very common for me. And I remember struggling to try to do my homework, submit that on time. The interesting thing is I always had intent. I wanted to finish my homework, but I really, really felt like I couldn't. It was very difficult. And so I got through IIT, again, one of the very few computer science women, and went to Maryland College Park to do my master's. And I was 22, and I remember really I can't, one of the, the core moments of tradition, Indian tradition, playing a role in my life. I picked up my mom and dad from the airport here in Maryland, and my dad found out that I was just talking with a boy, trying to see if it would go somewhere. And my dad said, you can't speak with a boy. You either marry the boy or you don't speak to a boy. <laughs> so by the time we got home, he did some diligence with my brother's help on the boy's background and said, looks good. Let's get, let's get the date down. <laughs> Probably two months later, I was married. And that was it. And I was too shy and too nervous to stand up to my dad then. All I knew is that he was speaking from convention. Women in India get married. They get a college degree, maybe they don't, but they get married. That's what success is measured as for women in India. And I didn't pause to think, does that convention make sense for who I am? And now after more than 10 years being removed from that one incident, I look back and I realize convention is what it is. But if I had the courage to question it and understand, does it make sense for me, I probably would have been in a different place. Now, looking back, I love to connect the dots and say it was the best thing ever because it built me into a really strong woman. But the truth really is, it would have been really valuable if I'd stopped to question, well, why? For many women in India, there is no other route. They haven't gone to IIT. They haven't studied computer science. And so it does make sense. Go into a household, have children, raise them, do the best you can with what you have. And I realized a few months into my marriage that there were misaligned values. We, we spoke past each other. We didn't truly understand each other. It was very traditionally arranged marriage. And I realized I was a very strong woman. Soon into it, I wanted to have a voice. I wanted to do the best I possibly ever could. Four years later, after perhaps the most challenging part of my life, I made the most difficult decision I've ever had to make, which is against Indian society. I, along with my parents and my brother's support, decided to leave that marriage. And it took me a couple years of lots of reflection and introspection to be confident to speak about it with others. A lot of, a, a couple years. But I had to look back and use it as an opportunity to reflect on what my values are. Who am I? And so soon after, I decided to go to a startup, one bold step at a time. But I went to a 25-person startup saying, I want to be somebody in a company that makes an impact on the company. And so I did. I went to Cosmics, and it was great. I was one of 12 engineers. And I learned a lot, and I grew a lot, and it was great. And then I went to Facebook a little bit later, and I was on the Newsfeed team working on as an engineer. Facebook at the time was 500. So I didn't feel like I was making as big an impact, but everything else you know, was wonderful working there and seeing how a great company was being built. I had the opportunity to go to Stanford Business School. And this is 2008. This was a... Um, first of all, welcome to this first live version of the um, Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series, the A. Richard Newton Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series. Uh, if you... Um, uh, I'm happy to welcome you, first of all, for it. But if you uh, haven't been to B-Space, you haven't watched our you know, Emmy Award video, the one that we made for you, and the one that um, has basically the rules of how this thing works and you know all the stuff that you're um, kind of like the guidelines of, of how to participate in the lecture series, please do that. I'm not going to repeat the quote rules and, and the model right now, but uh, so go to BSpace for that. Uh, it's um, my so of the approximately six lectures that you're going to get this semester, this is the first of the live ones, and it's my pleasure to introduce Pooja Sankar, who um, is the CEO of Piazza, and founder and CEO. Uh, I think you probably know it's an online course platform 
Uh, here's a few statistics. It's in 25 countries. Uh, 1,000 universities use it. Uh, 10,000 courses are, are on it. Uh, Pooja has, a, um, has degrees from IIT Kanpur, from University of Maryland, and from Stanford. She's, been, she's worked at uh, um, Facebook, at Cosmics, and at Oracle uh, prior to um, uh, starting the company. Uh, and from what I know of the talk, uh, she's going to touch on uh, the importance of getting out of uh, comfort zone, which um, we think uh, here is uh, seminal to both entrepreneurship and to engineering leadership. So with that, I'm really happy that you're able to join us today and to be our first speaker of the series. Pooja, please. Okay. Awesome. Well, it's really good to be here. Uh, just show of hands, how many of you have heard of Piazza? <laughs> how many of you would have thought five years ago that I was convinced that whatever I did in my career, I'd never, never actually start a company? So five years ago, I thought whatever I did, I'd never start a company because it sounded terrifying. <laughs> That's the really interesting bit. Uh, today, a bit about myself. I am married to Sham Sankar. Um, we have a baby, one year old. I live with his parents and they help raise our child. Uh, I started a company four years ago. It's going really well now. Every top school, we have almost over 90% of STEM students using it across the world. And uh, he runs Palantir, so we're a really good household in the sense of both of us understand what it's like to push our careers to the limit. And interestingly enough, I actually went into Stanford Business School and failed. And my brother said, how do you possibly ever fail business school? Um, I entered into a very traditional arranged marriage at 22 when I knew barely anything about life. And four years later, left that. And today, I will say I'm very grateful for that because it's built me into who I am today. And when I look back at all the happy moments, all the great things that have happened, I have fond memories and I smile. But when I look back at all the challenging moments in my life, which there are many of, I'm very grateful because it's built me into who I am today. And I actually want to touch a lot more into the past that has been, if anything, challenging because I hope to share my perspective in this room today. So I was actually born in India, but I don't have an Indian accent because at the age of two, my dad chose to take all of us over to Canada and America while he was doing his PhD and postdoctorate as a professor. And at the age of 11, he and my mother had a choice to go back to India and raise us, my brother and I, and the Indian culture and values, or here in America. And he claims that he wanted to expose me and my brother to Indian culture and values, but I like to believe he didn't want us dating as a teenager here. So he moved us back to India, and it was a very, very difficult move. I was 11. I was used to growing up in a country that had pretty much anything you could ever want, to a city in India that maybe had four hours of electricity in the day, maybe four hours of running water in the day. And we'd all pack up in a car or a train and go to villages and visit all of our relatives. And I really saw what it was like to live and breathe in villages in India. And it was very difficult. I actually wasn't happy with my parents for moving me back for a really long time. It took me a couple of years. But then I started to get really, really in love with the family, the people, the culture. And I grew up there in a really kind of a traditional Indian system where actually up until college, girls weren't allowed to speak to boys and boys were not allowed to speak to girls. And that was okay. But then I got into IIT, which was predominantly boys, maybe three girls in my class. And that's really the starting of Piazza, which is when I was struggling on my homework, I always wished I had help and I was too shy to speak to all the boys in my class. I don't know if this is a common feeling here among especially the girls or the Shire students. But it was very common for me. And I remember struggling to try to do my homework, submit that on time. The interesting thing is I always had intent. I wanted to finish my homework, but I really, really felt like I couldn't. It was very difficult. And so I got through IIT, again, one of the very few computer science women, and went to Maryland College Park to do my master's. And I was 22, and I remember really I can't, one of the, the core moments of tradition, Indian tradition, playing a role in my life. I picked up my mom and dad from the airport here in Maryland, and my dad found out that I was just talking with a boy, trying to see if it would go somewhere. And my dad said, you can't speak with a boy. You either marry the boy or you don't speak to a boy. <laughs> 
So by the time we got home, he did some diligence with my brother's help on the boy's background and said, looks good, let's get, let's get the date down. <laughs> Probably two months later, I was married. And that was it. And I was too shy and too nervous to stand up to my dad then. All I knew is that he was speaking from convention. Women in India get married. They get a college degree, maybe they don't, but they get married. That's what success is measured as for women in India. And I didn't pause to think, does that convention make sense for who I am? And now after more than 10 years being removed from that one incident, I look back and I realize convention is what it is. But if I had the courage to question it and understand, does it make sense for me, I probably would have been in a different place. Now looking back, I love to connect the dots and say it was the best thing ever because it built me into a really strong woman. But the truth really is, it would have been really valuable if I'd stopped to question, well, why? For many women in India, there is no other route. They haven't gone to IIT. They haven't studied computer science. And so it does make sense. Go into a household, have children, raise them, do the best you can with what you have. And I realized a few months into my marriage that there were misaligned values. We, we spoke past each other. We didn't truly understand each other. It was very traditionally arranged marriage. And I realized I was a very strong woman. Soon into it, I wanted to have a voice. I wanted to do the best I possibly ever could. Four years later, after perhaps the most challenging part of my life, I made the most difficult decision I've ever had to make, which is against Indian society. I, along with my parents and my brother's support, decided to leave that marriage. And it took me a couple years of lots of reflection and introspection to be confident to speak about it with others. A lot of, a, a couple years. But I had to look back and use it as an opportunity to reflect on what my values are. Who am I? And so soon after, I decided to go to a startup, one bold step at a time. But I went to a 25-person startup saying, I want to be somebody in a company that makes an impact on the company. And so I did. I went to Cosmics. And it was great. I was one of 12 engineers. And I learned a lot, and I grew a lot, and it was great. And then I went to Facebook a little bit later. And I was on the newsfeed team working on as an engineer. Facebook at the time was 500. So I didn't feel like I was making as big an impact, but everything else you know, was wonderful working there and seeing how a great company was being built. I had the opportunity to go to Stanford Business School. And this is 2008. This was a very difficult choice because equity for Facebook on the table versus you give up potentially millions of dollars and go to Stanford and probably become broke, which I did. <laughs> But I remember at the time, and my parents were very supportive, my dad especially, having seen what education could do for people in this world, supported me to go to Stanford. And he said, focus on growing yourself. And so I did. I left Facebook without having vested anything. And I still, to this day, don't regret it. Because I feel like I'm a stronger person, a stronger individual who's contributing in my own way and having reached my own potential. And that's all I want to optimize around. Am I getting closer to reaching my full potential? So I went to Stanford Business School in 2008, and I had never done undergrad in this country, so it was a bit of a culture shock, lots of things going on in 2008. Fascinating enough, whereas I saw many of my classmates getting torn between attending events or going to certain talks or seizing certain opportunities, I, I realized making decisions on what to do and what not to do or what to give up was very easy because I had taken the past couple years to really reflect deeply on what matters to me and what my values are. And suddenly choosing between the number of options out there, it was very easy to apply that lens at all the time. So I did. And 2009, I was sitting in an entrepreneurship class, and every week they had speakers come in and share their story. And I felt very inspired. It's like, well, maybe, maybe just maybe I can think about an idea I have. I don't have to think yet about the big, you know, raise $10 million, take it to a million students, nothing, but just think about the idea. So I started to do that. And day after day, week after week, more and more discussions with people, I realized I was truly passionate about helping solve the problem of that student who feels isolated in a classroom but wants to learn. Four months later, all my classmates, now this is between the first and second year of business school, were starting to think about internships where they would get paid well. And that was a difficult decision. It's like, well, do I just get some money over the summer and kind of replenish my bank account, which is starting to run low? Or do I just not do that and sit in a garage? And I moved in with my brother and worked out of his garage, picked up a book on Ruby on Rails, 
and coded the first prototype of Piazza, it is not, it was not as pretty as Piazza looks today. <laughs> so, <laughs> built a website that actually worked. And I remember that too, the decision to have to go and build my own prototype was terrifying. For five months I'd been trying to find an undergrad at Stanford who would build it for me, but no one shared the vision. And one advisor said, Pooja, you're just going to have to pick up a book, learn how to code Ruby, and build it. And I still remember I was on the car driving up 280 to San Francisco for a dinner, probably the dullest dinner ever because I was so quiet. But I, I internalized that I was going to have to code this. And so I took a month and learned Ruby and built a website, and it worked. And then after that, every single step of the way, I remember coming back for my second year of business school, not motivated at this point to finish school. And all my classmates had come back from their internship, pretty much most of them disappointed, actually, in their experiences and what they got out of it. And they were amazed at how much I had accomplished in one summer. But at the same time, I remember opening my bank account and seeing how little money I had in the account. It was terrifying, to the point where when I would have multiple meetings on Stanford campus, in between if I had 30 minutes, instead of buying yogurt or fruit or a salad from the cafe, I would try to drive back home, eat some nuts, and then come back for the second meeting. That wasn't smart. I actually had to optimize them around my time and my decision-making ability, but I saw the crippling effects of having barely any money in the bank. It was terrifying. And I remember calling my dad at the time, he was in India, and I said, Dad, I'm really scared. I don't know how I can go through my second year of college. I had gone to the financial loan people, and they said, you've maxed out your loans. You can't take any more money. And my dad said, Pooja, believe in yourself and, and do whatever you can. I am there for you. I will give you whatever you need. You have been through a four-year-long traditional marriage. You got out of that. You have so much potential and so much hope ahead for your life. And keep doing what you love doing. Keep doing what you're passionate about. And so he wired some money to me, and it was huge. It was probably the only reason I got through my second year of school. But when I look back, I've seen, I've seen what terrifying moments like that can do to decision-making abilities. And that's why I want to always make sure that for my team, for us at Piazza, we're always feeling stable and financially secure because I want us to be optimizing around my vision. So after that... Near the, set, near the end of the second year of business school, I met a gentleman through an introduction, Sham Sankar, who I'm happily married to now. And I remember the last quarter, I had three things on my plate. Well, I had running a company, I had investing in a new relationship that I thought had huge potential, and I had wrapping up business school. And of course, as any sane person, you'd let school slip, right? <laughs> well, I did. And I'm very glad I did. I'm not advocating anything here in this room. <laughs> but I optimized around my passion and continued to run Piazza and actually started to raise money for my company so I could get a salary and pay myself. I optimized around this new person I just met in my life, Sham. And yes, when I walked the stage, when everyone else had a piece of paper in their folder, I had nothing. Surprisingly, my parents took it really well. My dad always had a hunch I wouldn't graduate. <laughs> Dozens of times he would hear how much I was invested in Piazza, and he'd always say, are you sure you're going to graduate from Stanford? And I'd say, yeah, Dad, of course I am. Turns out later, I, you know, I graduated a term later, and I got the most efficient MBA possible. You have to, you have to get 100 credits and a minimum of 2.65 GPA, and I know this is being recorded, but I got 100 units, and I got a 2.67 GPA. <laughs> That's efficiency. <laughs> so by the time I was wrapping up Stanford, Piazza was still very early. Maybe five classes had used it, and mostly all at Stanford. And that fall, we were in about 10 classes, and I remember this discussion, this opportunity where a company wanted to buy us. And again, it was, what do I do? And it came back to my values. And I was like, well, I deeply, deeply believe in what I'm doing. If I wanted money, I would have stayed at Facebook. But that's not what I wanted. I want to keep investing in myself. I want to grow. I want to push my own limits. I want to feel uncomfortable. Because when I look back, that is when I've grown the most. And so I continued to plow through. 
And I remember, I remember the price we were thinking even about was based on five classes using a product I'd built over maybe a year. And we're three years past that, and we've had over 10,000 classes use Piazza in well over dozens of countries. I have logged on to classes being used in multiple different languages that I can't read, but I like to think what they're saying. <laughs> they ask really tough questions. <laughs> and January of 2011, Sham prodded me and said, why are you just stuck in Stanford? Why don't you go to more schools? And that thought hadn't even occurred to me, the perspective that the product was good enough and I should try to take it to more campuses had not even occurred to me because I was starting to get into my comfort zone of optimizing around just hundreds of students. That's what was starting to get comfortable and you know, I knew how to do. And so I drove up to Berkeley and I knocked on some doors at Soda Hall. <laughs> no one had heard of me. And this one professor, Dan Garcia, he saw me and I said, hi, my name's Pooja. I just graduated from Stanford. I built a site that many Stanford students and professors are using. Can I show you a demo? And he said, sure, you have five minutes. I will say it pays off to look like a student. He did not, my theory is he did not kick me out because I looked like a student at first, and that's really good. So I started to give him a demo, and surprisingly, the product was so mature that he who's been teaching for 19 years looked at the product and said, Pooja, every problem point I have had with any other solution you have figured out in your product. And that was not a coincidence. That came out of one and a half years of working very, very, very closely with a handful of just professors and students who lived very close to me and I could go knock on their door, show them the product, and get their feedback. So while I was still in that room, he composed an email to the entire EECS faculty at Berkeley and then said, Pooja, there is a conference coming up, and if you go to it and present, I will send an email to a thousand professor mailing list. It's like, of course, that would be awesome. And he said, great, it's March 9th. The conference is on March 9th, and I was getting married March 5th. So the good news was it wasn't March 5th, because that would have been a little problematic, but it was March 9th. My husband and I had booked a whole vacation home for a week after our wedding and it invited our parents from India and Orlando to spend the week. We very politely had to tell them you guys are out March 7th, I'm on a plane. And interestingly, Shams, uh, uh, Palantir CEO, you know, I remember him prodding Shams, so what, you're, are, you, are you cutting your honeymoon short? And he's like, no, my wife's doing that. Uh, very, very interestingly enough. So, so I went to this conference and Dan Garcia did exactly what he said. He sent an email to 1,000 professors. And immediately, overnight, we were in over 300 schools. And I presented at the conference and people loved the product. And suddenly, they started to take it to more and more countries. So this is starting to be 2011. 2012, we continued to grow. I will say I've had to push myself and how to hire a team, of which a few people are right here. Uh, it has been the most interesting challenge in many ways. How do you inspire the smartest of the people to join your team to build out this vision? And for us, I found it actually easier than when I've compared notes with other CEOs. But having a mission that many, many students can relate to and believe in has definitely made it easier to build out a great team. 2013, here we are. Last year I had a baby and don't know how I got through that. Uh, they say that you get certain type of short-term memory loss when you have a baby and I believe that. So my son's one year old now and he walks. The team, the team is now, as I think more and more about it, for Piazza, the team is everything. And it's fascinating how my per, uh, per perspective has changed from 2009 to 2010 to when it was all me, my ideas, execution, getting it out, getting it to more and more and more people, to now how do we build an organization that can scale my vision? And I will say we're just about starting, but I'm really, really excited for that stage. Tying it back to what I wanted to say at the very beginning, I really believe that I have developed, maybe not my full potential, but much more of my potential, because along the way I've had circumstances that at the time have seemed very, very difficult, very challenging. If anything, I don't know why I'm in this situation or how to get out of it. But looking back, it's the times that have forced me to become very strong and always question, deeply understand my values, question them. 
is what I'm doing aligned with my values? And so if you ever find an opportunity, if the one thought you could take, or if you ever find an opportunity where you have you know, society stating what convention is, I would say the most powerful thing could be ask, does it make sense for you? Does it make sense for your situation? And you know, ahead of you, I would think there are so many opportunities, whether it's careers, whether it's personal, whether it's growth, whether it's how you want to push yourself, whether it's balancing 20 different things at school. And I know my life after that first traditional arranged marriage where I was forced to redefine and really understand a lot about myself, everything's become so much more black and white, so much easier for me. Thank you. What was the biggest hurdle that you overcame when you were creating this project or this um, program on your own? Wow, there are so many. <laughs> biggest hurdle. I would say finding that first engineer who took my prototype into reality was probably the biggest. And I believe my story is more of a fluke, and I'll share mm -hmm. it in case anyone else could ever do the same thing and benefit from a similar sort of way of overcoming the hurdle. But I, I really was clueless on how to go about finding an engineer. I had been trying to talk with many undergrads at Stanford for quite a while, and I didn't feel like anyone understood my vision and was passionate enough to join. So I put an ad out on Craigslist. Anyone who has heard that is shocked. And I found the most brilliant engineer who then joined, and he's still with us today. Again, I don't know if I'm advocating put an ad out on Craigslist, but the reason for that was driven by a very low bank balance. Uh, Craigslist job postings are the cheapest out there. So I remember pulling out my credit card at midnight at, at a computer lab in San Francisco, saying, well, this could be $75 down the drain, or it could be the best use of $75, and it definitely turned out to be the best use of $75. I thought there was a hand over here. Hi, I wanted to ask how um, working at Facebook ever, like, did it affect your decisions in making, like, creating the company or because you've covered how going to Stanford and then, like, not taking the internship versus just developing the prototype, but how did um, your previous experience with Facebook or um, the other companies you worked at help? Actually, quite a bit. Uh, I loved the transparency at Facebook. I loved that all employees had pretty open access, you know, when we were 500 people, to Cheryl or Mark Zuckerberg. I loved that they used to have weekly Q&A sessions where people on the team got to ask the leadership of the company questions and how they were thinking about various de decisions, trade-offs, priorities for the company. And so I've really tried incorporating a lot of that at Piazza, actually. There's a question over here. Hi, so uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, if you were to graduate today, would you do things differently? Uh, like, what would you do? So graduate from undergrad, my master's, or my MBA? Your master's. Master's in CS? The first one, yeah? Yeah. It's fascinating. That, that again, has a lot of context behind my answer, so... Given who I was and the sort of skills I did have up until my master's, I, I think it was good to go to Oracle, but I'll share the context behind why I think it was good. Uh, I wasn't that hacker type in undergrad, nor in my master's, because I didn't have open access to all my classmates, but I watched a handful of classmates in my undergrad. They could just whip up projects like crazy and what I loved about Oracle was the amount of structure and guided mentorship that I got. But on the flip side, you know, it could have been frustrating. Again, this is hypothetical, but it could have been frustrating if like, I had done 20 projects of my own, you know, two in class and 18 on the side, and I was like, well, I can kind of move faster usually. So I, I, do think, I do think for me personally it was okay. But looking back now, I know that I fit best in the very smallest of environments. Uh, Leah, right uh, at the end. 
Hi, yeah. Thanks for the talk. It was really good. Um, you were talking about how in the beginning it was just you because you didn't find anyone else that shared your vision. At what point did you realize that you needed a team? And in that team, what were you looking for? I was always looking for a team. But this is one of those things, again, where I found many of my classmates at Stanford Business School begin to pair off and call them co-founders. And I knew deep inside that that would make me feel more comfortable. But it wasn't right because the vision would be compromised. And so I chose a path that I can't remember anyone at the time in my class taking, which was starting a company by myself, because I didn't want to compromise on the quality of what we were going to build and the value that we were going to deliver. Uh, but coming back to my first sentence, I was always looking for a team. I was always trying to meet people, always trying to convince them, always trying to get my passion out to those people. Uh, the first person who joined was the person that from Craigslist saw, Craigslist saw my ad. Uh, building a team, I will definitely say, has been the toughest part a very continual, very gradual, very challenging part of the company so far in that I don't want to compromise on the quality of people. I don't want to compromise on our aligned values, aligned culture. And so at the same time, you have to have a balance of like, well, if I'm going to stick to exactly these set of criteria, I'm probably never going to find anyone because those sorts of people get attracted only when we've built enough to have traction, to have proven ourselves out. So in the earlier years, uh, a lot of what I did, and again, this worked for me. I don't know if this is what you know, would work for everyone in this room, but I got lots of people as three-month interns from Stanford just kind of cobbling together code along the way and doing whatever it took, and then they'd go back to school and so on and so forth. And just through that kind of get to step functions where we're at a point now where we definitely get probably 50 resumes in a day. Hi. Um, what do you look for when you build your when building your Piazza team, and what culture do you go for? A positive attitude would be a pretty big one, because the odds are against us as a startup. And so, if we we have anyone today join who could get easily let down, or you know, any level of cynicism or skepticism or the negative negativity. Uh, that's, I think, a bit, very big turnoff for me personally when I'm interviewing with someone and to know that they can come in and just kind of really uplift the whole atmosphere when times are tough, especially. And lots of other things, obviously, of like, you know, they should be very smart. They should be great with wanting to always learn and grow. That's a huge one because I found, I, if anything, I think that reflects me. I do believe I've been through a number of unique scenarios that not everyone has, but what's gotten me to be able to pull myself out of it and actually immediately re rebound, be super energized, super positive, are, are some of these traits of you know, that positive attitude or always taking a very difficult situation and say, great, I want to learn and grow through this. It's going to be super painful, but that's what I'm going to do. I saw a couple hands over here. I know you've been waiting. Um, could you talk a little more about some of the, the biggest mistakes you've made along the way? For Piazza specifically? Sure, or yourself too. <laughs> sorry, sorry, what was the last thing? Like, in your, per like, things you would avoid. Like you'd... I, I would say, just coming back to the hiring, but letting some of the constraints be lax for that immediate, oh, I'm super excited, uh, those have been some of the things where now I have a more tempered person on the team and I let him do the first pass on all our candidates and I don't let myself get swooped in because I'm like, oh, I'm alone. We need to bring this person on. And so now uh, we actually have two of our team members right here. But with both of them, for example, my team member Ajay had to do the initial pass. And then he's like, Pooja, close them. And, and then you should see me get my phone out, bug these people, want to meet them immediately. And then I go into my clothes. <laughs> Um, so it sounds like you had to make a lot of big decisions, um, but I was wondering, you know, you have to stick with the decision the whole way through, and that's usually how it works. What are some criteria that you have, like, for making a decision when there's so many uncertainties, and also how do you deal with the uncertainties? I think there are two themes of decisions, one that you actually can change, and one that you can't. You decide to have a baby, you have a baby. 
you decide you want a feature, even after it's been implemented, it's right about to be pushed, it's been pushed, you pull it back. Uh, the decisions that, there are very few in my mind that you can't change. And I guess my past history shows I do trial and error, so I got married once. <laughs> Didn't work, and then I totally knew what to do next time, and it was perfect. But uh, I actually believe that there are very few decisions that you can't change. I believe most of the decisions at any time. Now, this is exactly where, if I had the courage at the age of 22, even after we were engaged, for example, for that two months, I could have said, I'm scared and I'm not ready to do this. I did not have that courage. But in most other things, and again, you kind of make a decision at that big a scale and it goes wrong, it's much easier to admit to mistakes on other decisions and say, I'm going to change my mind. So in fact, at the company, I do a lot of that. I'm very, very comfortable saying, you know, I thought this. This is new data that's come in. In light of all this new data and just letting the initial decision marinate, I changed my mind, and this is what we're going to do now. I love to share context with people on the team so that they understand where I'm coming from or anyone in my family or on the team or anywhere else. Not sure it helps, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure I agree with that first sentence, which is decisions can't be changed. Um, yes, hi. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, one is, um, what made you choose Ruby on Rails to like start? Uh, while trying to recruit, oh, should, I, should I answer it now or wait for your second question? Um, just answer it now. Okay. Last. <laughs> so while trying to recruit a very smart engineer to build a site for me, he said he knows Ruby on Rails, Ooh. and he said he would guide me and advise me through the way, which he did. Mm -hmm. It's the only reason my site was up in 10 days, because there were four days where I would just walk to his office with my laptop and say, help me debug this. Mm. Uh, but at that time, I optim optimized around guidance I could get. So it's really just knowing that he would help me, and you know, late nights on Google Chat, he would just be there answering my questions. OK, cool. My second question is, how do I get an internship next summer? <laughs> <laughs> Love the question. Uh, Come by afterwards. <gasps> that was a very inspiring talk, Pooja. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so my question is, uh, going forward, what is your vision for Piazza? I definitely want to enable or facilitate students who want to genuinely learn to be able to learn with the collective knowledge of the people who I believe are in the best position to help the student, which really is the same set of classmates, TAs, and professors. And eventually, I want that sort of learning to broaden beyond just class material, but even what do I do in life? What sort of career opportunities make sense to me? You know, should I go to a startup, 20 person? Should I found, found my own company? Should I go to a 500 person or should I go to the East Coast? Would, would New York make sense for me? Would Boston make sense for me? Would international nonprofit make sense for me? And so learning in the broadest possible sense. So I don't know if you know about the Wits On program, women in tech kind of sharing online, but it was a mentorship program really targeted to women in STEM. For undergrad students, women teaching faculty STEM subject, in faculty STEM subjects as well as uh, professional and just trying to uh, facilitate communication. How do you decide if you want to stay in academia, do a PhD, or go into the real world, get some experience? And uh, hopefully, really, again, what I'm hoping for is make it very effect effective and efficient to help students realize their full potential. I think there's one more question over here. Hey, I'm um, just wondering how big was the team when Piazza took off, and uh, how did the team grow? So we're 12 people today, and so the three of us here are about 25% of the team or so. <laughs> so you can extrapolate to try to build how tiny the team actually is. Um, again, work in progress, so, and it's not really clear when Piazza took off, but I would say meeting Dan Garcia was pretty seminal in that, where he shot off some emails, and we immediately went from a few hundred students to... 20,000 students using Piazza, so perhaps that was one inflection point. But now over the time, we'd have actually have had over hundreds of thousands. Uh, it's been gradual growing, and the team, again, has been a mix of part-time, interns, whoever I could get, 
uh, to now the very first time where all 12 of us are full-time, you know, brilliant, culture fit, aligned in values, so on and so forth. So. Um, I was just wondering, where does the name Piazza come from? So sitting in the last row of a very not interesting finance accounting class in Stanford, and uh, 